Let's give our youth band a round of applause here. We're getting the youth involved in the campaign. Thank you. They're, they're doing a great job traveling in different parts of the country for us. I wanted to share with you immediately getting into what matters right now. Let's start with what's going on internationally in Israel. Our top job as a country today is to make sure that we are strong at home while standing for our allies in Israel. And I think the way we got to approach this is cool, level-headed, calm, and rationality. What does that mean? We have to stand for Israel's right to defend its own borders while making sure that we avoid broader regional conflict and World War III that wouldn't advance American interests. And then most importantly of all, and I say this coming to you today, right now where I flew here from, was Eagle Pass on our own southern border, still processing what I saw down there, making sure that we protect the homeland right here at home in the United States of America. Last weekend, I was in Pittsburgh, New Hampshire, on our northern border, earlier today on our own southern border. And I am alarmed right now that nobody is talking about it. It's why I wanted to open with this. We have to protect our own homeland in this country now more than ever, border defenses that are absolutely lacking, 70,000 special interest aliens coming to this country from countries that have Islamic jihadist ties right here to the United States, 70,000 of them apprehended, cyber defenses, super EMP defenses, nuclear missile defenses, all of which are lacking right here at home in our homeland. And I want to share that with you. That's been on my mind since we were on the southern border earlier today. It's a travesty what we saw, but it leads to what I wanted to talk to you about today. We're in the middle of a war in the United States of America right now. It is not a war between black and white, as the media would have you believe at times. It is not even a war between Democrats and Republicans, not really. It is a war between those of us in the United States of America who believe in our founding ideals, who believe that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights among these life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, who believe in Martin Luther King's creed that you get ahead in this country not on the color of your skin, but on the content of your character and your contributions, who believe in the rule of law, in free speech and open debate, the pursuit of excellence, who believe that the United States is the nation founded on the greatest ideals known to man, that American exceptionalism is real, that even though we're an imperfect nation, we're founded on the pursuit of a more perfect union, the pursuit of liberty, equality, and justice for all. That is one side of this war. And on the other side of this war, we have a different view. One that says your identity is based on your race, your gender, and your sexuality. That if you're black, you're inherently disadvantaged. That if you're white, you're inherently privileged. No matter your economic background or your upbringing, your genetics determine who you are and what you can achieve in life. Who believe that we have to abandon carbon emissions in the United States at all costs, even as we shift those same carbon emissions to places like China. Who believe that we can use our military to protect somebody else's border halfway around the world, but it's unjust to use our own military to protect our own border. Who wish to apologize for the American way of life. Why do I call this a war? I call this a war because there's no middle ground between these two views. Either you believe in meritocracy or you believe in group quotas. Either you believe in American exceptionalism or you believe in American apologism. There's no having both. And the first step to winning a war is knowing that you're in one in the first place. I have good news for you. <laughs> Thank you. Is that the baby? <laughs> 
knows we're in the war. I appreciate that. The good news I have is that most of us in this country, I've traveled to most of the states in this union, most of us, 80% of us in this country easily are on the pro-American side of this war. Black or white, even Democrat or Republican. And even better news is half the 20%, they're people younger than me who never learned those ideals in the first place. We're going to bring them along too. But the bad news is that the other side is still winning this war right now. And what I want to talk to you about tonight is why. I'll tell you, I got my first job in the fall of 2007 on the eve of the 08 financial crisis at a financial firm in New York. Interesting time to get a first job. What happened back then was we had just given in 08 the bailouts under a Republican administration from all of us, the taxpayers. We'd use that money to give it to a bunch of big banks on Wall Street. This is not a Republican or Democrat story. That happened in a Republican watch. And so the old left, Occupy Wall Street, said we want to take that money and redistribute it from those wealthy corporate fat cats and give it to poor people to help poor people. Agree or not, that's what the old left had to say. But right around that time, there was the birth of this new strand of the left that said it a little bit differently. He said, the real problem in this country, it's not economic injustice and poverty anymore, as the old left used to say. They said it's racial injustice and misogyny and bigotry and climate change. Well, if you're Wall Street, Occupy Wall Street is a tough pill to swallow. But the new woke stuff was actually pretty easy. <laughs> you applaud diversity and inclusion. Put some token minorities on your boards. Muse about climate change after you fly in a private jet to Davos. It's good work if you can get it. But they didn't do it for free. They expected the new left to look the other way when it came to leaving their own corporate power intact. And it worked masterfully for both sides. So that's where I first saw it. I was on Wall Street right as that happened, played out in the aftermath of the 08 crisis. But then you open your eyes and you see the same thing was happening in every area of American life. These strange bedfellows getting in bed together. They don't love each other. It's an arranged marriage, not of love. It's more like mutual prostitution. And the net result was the birth of this woke industrial complex that's far more powerful than just big government or big business because it's a hybrid of the two that together did what neither could alone. So Silicon Valley, it turned out, was doing the same thing. The old version of breakup big tech used to come from the left, actually. So Silicon Valley said, you know what? We'll censor hate speech and misinformation as you define it. But we won't do it for free. We expect the new left to look the other way when it comes to leaving our monopoly power intact. And again, that worked masterfully for both sides. Well, then you open your eyes and you see this everywhere. Coca-Cola issuing statements about new voting laws in Georgia that make it sound more like a super PAC than a soft drink manufacturer. Teaching their employees how to be less white. Their words, not mine. But not saying a peep about what they used to get criticized for was spreading diabetes and obesity, including in the black communities where they profess to care so much about them. You go one step after another, it's the hypocrisy. So, so then you open your eyes, because this, this is a mystery story. I'm, I'm telling you guys this, really frankly, my campaign advisors, they all tell me, don't, don't do all this stuff on stage. It's too complicated. Simplify it. Dumb it down. No. The truth is complicated right now. we got to be able to see it with clear eyes. Open your eyes. You then see it in every area of life. Look at our K-12 through education system. They locked those schools. Told our kids in the inner cities they couldn't go to school for two years because apparently only COVID only affects public schools but not private schools. What do they say now? Last year they say that math is racist. Hmm. Because black kids are not doing as well on math tests as white kids. Well, math isn't racist. Two plus two still equals four. But what might have been inequitable was failing to teach those kids in the inner cities how to do math for two years. It's woke smoke to deflect accountability for their own failure. So it's just one area after another. College, I'm a millennial. I'm 38 years old. My generation, many of my peers still haven't paid off their student loan debts. Well, many of them were told, you become a gender studies major in California, somehow that's a head start on the American dream. That didn't work out. 
What do you get in college? You got a little bit of critical race theory and some critical gender theory to give yourself a victimhood narrative to explain why you're swimming in debt when in fact it was a system that failed us. You ask about wokeness in the military. I mean, this is everywhere in American life, our own military. And this is relevant today, by the way, folks. I, <laughs> some of the Republican Party like to get me in trouble over saying this, but it's the truth. 25 years of failed wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, $3 trillion spent, thousands and thousands of innocent American lives lost. To what end? The Taliban is still in charge in Afghanistan, and hostile anti-American regime still in power in Iraq. This is pointless, and now's a moment, now more than ever, to learn those lessons and respond cool-headedly, as I said, to the present. But those mistakes of the past, remember, it was the left that was criticizing the military. So if you're General Mark Milley, what do you say? Let's talk about white rage and systemic racism to defang the criticism of the left. So this is the story of how that fringe minority in this country, that anti-American minority in this war, is winning this war because the swamp, the managerial class, inside government and out, propped them up to deflect criticism from the left where it used to come from so that they could keep their power structure intact. That's the first part of this story. You, once you see it, you can't unsee it. And then something happened. A third party then showed up on the scene and turned this arranged marriage into a three-party affair. That's the Communist Party of China. I didn't promise you this was going to be simple. I'm going to ask you to stay with me here. Xi Jinping, when he is pressed on the Uyghur human rights crisis, a million religious minorities enslaved in concentration camps, subject to forced sterilization, communist indoctrination, and worse. What does he say? Black Lives Matter shows that the United States is no better. Xi Jinping's words. Not an accident. His top diplomat comes to the Alaska summit, talks to our little pet puppet of a secretary of state called Tony Blinken or whatever, tells him that China wants to see the U.S. stop slaughtering, that is his word, slaughtering black Americans, and that China wants to see the U.S. do better on human rights. Now, this would be laughable if it weren't for the fact that our own companies and universities and K-12 through education, heck, our own military, lends credibility to those claims. Now, if you're BlackRock, you'll apply an emissions cap and talk about systemic racism in the U.S. Try doing that in China They'll say, shut the door on your way out. Why? They build a great Chinese wall that stops you from entering the Chinese market if you criticize the CCP or apply an emissions cap over there. But do those things in the United States, they will roll out the red carpet. That's how this game is played. And again, this is not a Democrat or Republican story, really. Both parties, for years, we thought we could export Big Macs and Happy Meals, and somehow that was going to spread democracy to places like China. We thought we could use our money to get them to be more like us. They did us one step worse. They realized they could use access to their market, their money, to get us to be more like them. It's actually one step worse. They realized they could use our money to get us to be more like them, and it worked. And here's the dirty little trick in that. That erodes our most valuable asset of all. That is not our nuclear arsenal. It is our moral standing on the global stage by creating a false equivalence between Chinese nihilism and American idealism. It's a complicated story, but it's the truth of how we got to where we are today. So the question is, what do we do with this information? Knowing that this fringe minority is winning this internal domestic war we're in because the managerial class at home and the CCP abroad is propping them up. What do we do with that? Abraham Lincoln said it well in 1863 at the height of our civil war then that the dogmas of a quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. And I say that the dogmas of 1980 are inadequate to address the unique challenges 
we face today in the year 2023. We need new solutions, led, if I may say so it myself, by a new generation to actually address the unique challenges of the present. First thing we need the next president to do, what I will do as your next president, gut that swamp, that managerial class. Get in there and shut it down. This is the real myth in American politics today. The people who we elect to run the government, we, I heard some of the discussion backstage you were having with Sean Spicer, good conversation about the dysfunction in Congress and all this. That's a sideshow compared to the reality. The reality is the people who we elect to run the government, they're not even the ones who actually run the government. It's the people in the deep state, the shadow government, the three-letter agencies that are really writing policy today. So you know what? What I've said is if I can't be your next president for more than eight years, which I think is a good thing, thankfully, then neither should any of those federal bureaucrats reporting into me either. Eight-year term limits for the bureaucracy instead of these civil service protections. That's how you drain the swamp. When there are government agencies that should not exist, from the FBI to the U.S. Department of Education to the ATF to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, we will get in there and shut them down. That's how you revive the integrity of a three-branch constitutional republic. 75% headcount reduction in the federal bureaucracy in Washington, D.C. Cut out 50% of unconstitutional federal regulations that fail West Virginia versus EPA, the Supreme Court's test last year. This is how you drive generational change. Drill, frack, burn coal, embrace nuclear. Stop paying people more money to stay at home than to go to work. Zero-based budgeting. Start not with last year's budget, but zero as the baseline, and then ask what's actually necessary. This is not moderate. I'm not a fan of moderation because America and our ideals are not moderate. This is what it's going to take to actually drive our nation forward. Not incrementalism, but a quantum leap to our future. That's domestically at home. And then abroad, you know, the other half of the story, the other culprit in the story was the Communist Party of China. That's the real threat we face. You know, my strategy is with respect to China, it's like Reagan said it with the USSR in 1980. We win, they lose. That's my strategy. We will declare independence from China. We have to cut the cord. We cannot depend on our enemy for our modern way of life. That is the declaration of independence that Thomas Jefferson would have signed if he were alive today. That's the declaration of independence that I'll sign as your next president. We cannot depend on an enemy. We're in a codependent relationship. Those don't end well. The only question is who ends it first. The first way we declare independence from China is unshackle ourselves from the climate cult here at home that shackles the United States while leaving China untouched. It is wrong. The same people who want us to stop burning carbon here say shift it to China. The same people who are opposed to carbon emissions are somehow also opposed Think about this, to nuclear energy, the best known form of carbon-free energy production known to mankind. Why? Because nuclear energy might be too good at solving their supposed made-up crisis because this is really not about the climate. It is about letting China catch up to the United States. Guess which one country on Earth has a Gen 4 nuclear reactor? That's China. Unshackle ourselves from that climate cult. Declare semiconductor independence from China. The little chips in our phones that light the back lights up, that light, the light up that refrigerator that keeps your water cold before you drink it tonight. Those depend on little chips, semiconductors made on an island nation off the southeast coast of China. We have to make those in the United States. Pharmaceutical independence in this country. 95% of our over-the-counter pharmaceuticals coming from our enemy in China. I came from that southern border today where China is sending over the synthetic ingredients to make fentanyl to the Mexican drug cartels, pumping that across our southern border, killing tens upon tens of thousands of innocent Americans here. You think the same country that's going to lace our illegal pharmaceutical supply chain with fentanyl isn't in a conflict scenario going to do the exact same thing? with our legal pharmaceutical supply chain that we rely on them for, the same country that unleashed hell on the world with the COVID-19 pandemic, forget about it. Our defense industrial base, the F-35s that we make in this country, the military equipment that we manufacture in the United States, 
It's laughable, but it's not funny. Depend on China to provide those parts. Think about it with me. Why are we accumulating military equipment if not to protect ourselves in a conflict scenario with an enemy that we depend on to provide the very parts to make that military equipment? That's where we need to declare independence from China. So these are not black ideas or white ideas. These are not even Democrat ideas or Republican ideas. These are fundamentally American ideals that we fought a revolution to secure in this country. And I think we live in a 1776 moment today. This is our moment to step up and revive our national identity. So it will take, knowing you're in a war to win that war, it will take a general from the next generation to lead us to the next generation because the real secret ingredient in winning this war is the final thing I'm going to close this on before opening this up for a few questions. Reviving our missing national pride in the United States of America. Young Americans in this country have lost their sense of national identity. 60% of young Americans say they would sooner give up their right to vote than to give up their access to TikTok. I'm not making that up. I think every high school senior who graduates from 12th grade should have to pass the same civics test that every immigrant has to pass in order to become a voting citizen of this country. You got to have skin in the game to play in the game. You got to know something about a country, not just passively inherit it. Part of the problem in my generation is we celebrated our diversity and our differences so much that we forgot all of the ways we're really just the same as Americans. Bound by that common set of ideals that set this country into motion 250 years ago. I believe it deep in my heart that those ideals still exist. I'm running for president to revive them, and I believe we can. And the way we're going to do it is all of us, not just me, all of us, starting to speak openly again. You want to know the best measure of our country's health, the best measure of American democracy's health? It's not the number of green pieces of paper in our bank account. It's not the number of ballots we cast every November. Those are important, but they're not the most important thing. It is the percentage of people who feel free to say what they actually think in public. Right now, we're doing poorly. The only way we're going to fix it is all of us starting to speak openly again. That is what this campaign is about. Speaking the truth, not just when it is easy, but when it is hard. Speaking the truth with conviction, with a spine, without apologizing for it. Speak it respectfully. But part of respect means saying in public what we will otherwise say in private. That is what we're doing tonight. Speak that truth with a spine, without apology. God is real. There are two genders. Fossil fuels are a requirement for human prosperity. Reverse racism is racism. An open border is not a border. Parents determine the education of their children. The nuclear family is the greatest form of governance known to mankind. Capitalism is the greatest system known to man to lift us up from poverty. There are three branches of government, not four. And the U.S. Constitution is the strongest and greatest guarantor of freedom in human history. That is the truth. We fight for the truth. We stand up for the truth. That is what won us the American Revolution. That is what reunited us after the Civil War. That is what won us two world wars and the Cold War. That is what still gives hope to the free world. And if we can revive that dream over group identity and victimhood and grievance, then nobody in the world, not a nation, not a corporation, not a virus, not China, is going to defeat us. That is what American exceptionalism is all about. And that is what we together will revive to save our great nation. Thank you all for coming out tonight. May God bless you. God bless your families. God bless the United States of America. Thank you.
We have time for questions. Actually, I promised some questions, so. You got a microphone? There, we'll take a couple. I promised questions. I forgot that. <laughs> we'll take a, take a couple questions, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ramaswamy, for taking my question. So you, you speak about being America first and uh, focusing on America. With the conflict that's broken out between Israel and Gaza and the Palestinians and the Hezbollah and Iran and Iraq and everything going on in the Middle East, what, if anything, should be the United States' role in that conflict and why? Excellent question and timely for now. So America first does not mean you're isolationist. It means that you look to every conflict abroad with a pro-American prism. What happened to Israel was wrong. It was barbaric, medieval in nature, what Hamas did to Israel. So the job of the United States of America is to make sure we defend Israel's right to defend itself using whatever means is necessary to stand for its own national self-existence. That means that we have to provide diplomatic support, make sure the UN doesn't pull its usual nonsense of drawing a false equivalence between Israel's self-defense and the terrorists who attack them. It means that we do intelligence sharing. We engage in diplomatic support of every kind, munitions support as they need it, but do it in a way that does not create broader regional war in the Middle East. That includes making sure Iran never becomes nuclear equipped, but I think it is beyond insane that we're having discussions with Saudi Arabia about nuclear equipping Saudi Arabia as well. And yes, that's different than every other candidate is talking about this. But what true friends do is we learn from each other. And I also want to learn from Israel to know that can happen right here at home. And we have to protect ourselves because if it can happen there with 70,000 special interest aliens in this country from hostile jihadist Islamic countries, we got to make sure that doesn't happen right here at home. So I'll take a couple more questions. Be respectful of the other folks here. If you want a quick follow-up, sure. we can come back to you after them. Right, you said uh, until we get semiconductor independence from Taiwan, we're going to defend Taiwan. Japan, uh, China has over 5,000 merchant ships. Logistics wins wars. We know that strategy wins battles. We have 85 ships left in this country. We don't produce one shipyard that can produce on time. 85 ships. How are we going? How are we going to defend Taiwan with 85 cargo? This ships? is why I love New Hampshire. We get real questions. <laughs> I appreciate that. So I never go into this level of detail in like general talks, but since you're asking me, we'll go into the detail. So we are too busy making, trying to make, and we're not making them either, large aircraft carriers. Those cost 13 billion a piece. Here's the quick way to replenish our Navy. At least make the frigates, which we can make for a tenth of that cost. Smaller ships to replenish our Navy now. So we can't sit around wringing our hands. We gotta do what's necessary now. Now I'm going to go one step deeper. We've got to build alliances with nations like India. I'm not saying that just because, you know, <laughs> I, I, it matters for the United States, right? So, so the Andaman Sea, that's where China gets its Middle Eastern oil supplies. 60% of Chinese oil comes through the Andaman Sea. We need a reliable partner to be able to block the Andaman Sea. India can do that for us if we get India on side. And if somebody's going to do that, it better be somebody with my long last name. Now you go to Taiwan. I love the Se who, who here loves the Second Amendment? All right, so do I. Well, let's export the Second Amendment to Taiwan. Put a gun in every Taiwanese household. Teach them how to use it. China's deathly afraid of a Second Amendment. I think that for the next several years, we need to be able to run a destroyer through the Taiwan Strait every week. Say affirmatively, we will defend Taiwan at least until we get semiconductor independence in this country, after which we resume the status quo, what it is now, of strategic ambiguity. That's the kind of strategic leadership it's going to take. Honesty with clear red lines, with consequences if you cross them. And Xi Jinping won't dare cross that on my watch. He'd have to be a fool to do it. But move from this vague strategic ambiguity of the broken foreign policy of the last 25 years to strategic clarity, both for ourselves, to our citizens, to our allies, and to our adversaries. 
That's the new America first foreign policy. And yes, it will take an outsider from a different generation to lead us forward. It doesn't follow the historical establishment approved talking points. That's not what I'm here to deliver as a vessel. It's an actual vision of how I'll lead this country as commander in chief. Thank you very much for that question, my man. We'll come right up here to the, to the front, to the gentleman. Oh, we'll go right here and then we'll pull it up here. Hi, uh, my name is Brandon Strzok. I created the Walk Away Campaign, the movement of people walking away from the Democratic Party. Thank you. Well done, my man. Thank you. You created it. I created it. I'm the OG. All right, I love Thank that. You. Yeah. Um, over the last couple of years, nearly a million people have joined the movement. We have tens of thousands of people who have created video and written testimonials telling their stories about walking away. Uh, I might be a little bit biased, but I believe it's one of the most powerful and impactful grassroots movements happening in the conservative movement. I also think it's the most exciting thing. Uh, despite this fact, the RNC has never acknowledged the walkaway campaign or the walkaway movement or any of the work that we've done. And no Republican pre presidential candidate has acknowledged the walkaway campaign. So I'd like to extend the opportunity for you to be the first Republican presidential candidate to acknowledge walkaway. And the, I'd love the opportunity to interview you someday, if that would be possible. Amen. We're Thank in. You. Thank you. And congratulations for what you're doing. You're welcome. Recognize this man for his efforts. I Thank appreciate you. that. And if I may say quickly, because of the success of walkaway, I was targeted on January 6th. I was raided by the FBI, arrested and thrown in jail. I did not enter the Capitol on January 6th. I did not commit any violence, vandalism, theft, or destruction, but my life was torn apart by the United States Department of Justice and the FBI. And the, the majority of my case was a complete and total lie. I was put in a position where I had to take a plea deal uh, as opposed to going along with uh, going to trial and potentially facing years in prison for things I did not do. I'm pretty sure that you will answer the question that you would pardon J6 uh, uh, prisoners, but I'd like to take it a step further and ask, because a lot of Republicans have stated that they would, or the candidates have stated with that they Only two, but yes, I'm one of them. Right. The, what I have a problem with is that a lot of them add the, the caveat, if people didn't really do anything wrong. The problem I have with this is I have yet to meet a Republican in leadership who knows any of the details of any January 6th case or why people pleaded guilty to crimes that they did not commit. So will you please take the time to learn why people pled guilty to crimes that they didn't commit? Amen. I, so you have my commitment on that. This one gets under my skin because this goes to the heart of why we have it. They put in the First Amendment for a reason. The First Amendment. It's the reason why I don't know if anyone's going to walk in tonight. Every time a protester walks into the room here, many events, it's happened. I traveled college campuses across this country. We had 1,200 kids that showed up in 24 hours notice in UT Austin on my way to the southern border. Not all of them agreed with me. We have protests at campuses when we show up. I give them the microphone, even if we disagree, because that's the American way. You tell people they cannot speak, that is when they scream. You tell people they cannot scream, that is when they tear things down. And our founding fathers understood that as well as we ought to today. So I've actually been very clear. I don't do the wishy-washy stuff. Anybody for whom there is no evidence of physical violence, J6 protesters who were peaceful, that is no evidence of violence, they will get a pardon on day one of my administration. Thank you. That's the answer. Thank you. Thank you. All I would say is please know that a lot of people pled guilty to committing violence who did not commit violence. I, I, I understand thank the you. pressure of that, and every case will be looked at one by one to thank make sure you. we get to justice. That's, thank, thank you. Thank you, man. We're going to come here for one last question, and then we'll wrap it up. Unless we have some in the back. We'll wrap up with this one. Hello. My name is Nigel from Middletown, Connecticut, eight-year Marine Corps veteran. And thank you, you know for your service, man. I appreciate that. Since you don't like mint words, neither do I. If you become president, will you declare Black Lives Matter, Antifa, and groups like that a terrorist organization? Well, their behavior has earned it, so why wouldn't we? Right? Antifa in particular, right? Black Lives Matter is a vague thing. Antifa, absolutely. We have to, and it's the same, it relates to that last question. We cannot have two tiers of justice in this country one for Biden, another for Trump, one for peaceful J6 protesters, another for Antifa, burning down half this country across the country. One for people of one political persuasion, another for people of a different political persuasion. And I want to step out of the present here, right? Because that's now considered a Republican talking point. I'm not a, I don't aspire to be just a partisan talking point guy. Let's look at this through an American lens. Our nation has been imperfect at other points in our national history. We have had two tiers of justice before for black Americans and white Americans. It exists, the left hits us for this back in 1870. 
That existed in this, in this country, particularly in the South. We have to acknowledge that. That was wrong then. But the civil rights issue of our time today is actually about political expression. And so you cannot have a justice system that weaponizes its use based on the political belief of the defendant. That is wrong. That will end on my watch. Now, we can't change the past except in one narrow case. The U.S. president can go back and pardon anybody who has been the victim of a politically motivated prosecution. Most presidents are a little scared to do this because there's political consequences. They wait till the very last day or the last week when they're in office. I say no. I'll take the arrows for it. We're doing it on January 20th, 2025, from peaceful J6 protesters to Donald Trump to Douglas Mackey to Julian Assange, you name it. Anybody who has been a victim of a politically motivated persecution through prosecution gets the pardon, and anybody who has escaped the law and the rule of justice due to their own violent acts will have justice to ultimately face. That's a commitment I give you on my watch. That's what I'll what say I want this, to hear. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll, I'll, say, I'll say this in closing, guys. I want to be respectful of everybody's time. We have a party, by the way, straight down the hall, free reception, you know, food and drink. I hope that's real. <laughs> but uh, it's going to be fun regardless. I want to say this in closing, though. We're taught to believe. I mean, you hear those questions. I, I get it. We're taught to believe that we're a nation in decline. We're taught to believe that we're at the end of the ancient Roman Empire. And all we have left is to fight over the scraps of a shrinking pie. I don't think so. I don't think we have to be that nation in decline. I don't think we have to be ancient Rome. I think as a nation, the truth is, we're really just a little... Young, actually. Going through our own version of adolescence. Figuring out who we're going to be when we grow up. And when you view it that way, it makes sense again. When you go through your adolescence, you go through that identity crisis. You lose your way a little bit. You lose your self-confidence. But we're stronger for it when we get to our adulthood on the other side. So no, I don't think we have to be that nation in decline. I think we can still yet be a nation in our ascent. Maybe the early stages of our ascent. Maybe we're not even yet at base camp. On our way still, yes, to that Shining city on a hill. That country where no matter who you are or where your parents came from or what your skin color is or how long your last name is in some of our cases, that you get ahead in this country with your own hard work, your own commitment, your own dedication, and that you know what? You are free to speak your mind at every step of the way. That is the American dream. That is what we are running to. And that is what we together will revive to save our great nation. I'll be at the party for the next couple of hours. We'll see you there. Thank you all. God bless you. God bless your families. God bless our country. Thank you. Thunder, feel the thunder. Lightning and the thunder. Thunder, feel the thunder. Thunder. Kids were laughing in my classes while I was skiing.